Look into different kinds of interactions between species. Next, let's turn to competition. Competition is presumed to be fairly harmful for both interacting species. Competition involves demand by two organisms for the same limiting resource. Most interactions between different species with similar ecological requirements are presumed to involve some form of competition. In thinking about competition, there are two main categories of competitive interactions. The first is called interference competition, where one species physically prevents another from gaining access to the resource. This might involve something like territorial behavior, where one species safely guards its resources and prevents another one from eating at their preferred feeding sites. As a case study of interspecific competition, we could look at the lion. The lion lives in Africa, and there are several other competing predators that also occupy the savannas. One is the hyena. The lions and hyenas really don't get on with each other at all, and they compete intensively for food. They'll fight over carcasses. The lions usually win, and in fact, if they can, they'll kill hyenas that get too close to them. Lions are really terrible, in fact, to many of these other species of carnivores, particularly African wild dogs. The African wild dog used to be fairly plentiful in the Serengeti, but that was back when our lion population in the Serengeti was relatively small. Over the last half century, the lion population has increased, and as the lion population has gone up, the wild dog population has gone down because lions will kill wild dogs if they can, and the wild dogs are terrified. They run away. And so now we have over 100 lions in our study area, and the wild dogs have vanished altogether. So the lions have driven the wild dogs to local extinction. The other way we see competition, besides direct interaction, is called exploitation competition. And here we have two species competing for the same resource, but one is better at extracting that resource than the other. This is how plants compete. Plants can't push each other aside or bite each other in the throat. Instead, they are silently sucking up as many, as many of the resources as they can from the soil. And those plant species that are most efficient at extracting soil nutrients are the most common in the community. Lupins are a good example. They're really good at competing against other flowering plants in meadows and become dominant because they're so efficient at extracting those resources. Now, to get an intuitive sense of how exploitation competition works, if you're a plant, all you can do is suck nutrients up out of the soil. And if you've got rather bad dental hygiene and you're trying to get the nutrients up with a straw, you're probably not going to be as successful as this girl on the right. So she'll be able to get many more resources out. And so her success will lead to her type becoming more common in the community. An important goal in these studies is to measure the outcomes of competition. In looking at ecological outcomes, we will often see, as we saw in the case of the wild dogs in the Serengeti, where one species drives another to local extinction. This is called competitive exclusion. As a laboratory example of this, let's take two different species of paramecium. These are little single-celled protozoans that if they are allowed to colonize a beaker of culture media, the population starts out small and then shows the lo logistic population growth and reaches the carrying capacity. Species A may be quite abundant when living by itself in a particular beaker, and another species of paramecium might be similarly abundant when it also lives by itself. But if we mix these two into the same beaker, we'll find that one species is more efficient at exploiting the resources than the other, and it drives the other to exclusion. That's competitive exclusion. However, if we have two different species who occupy a slightly different ecological niche, so we've got a third species of protozoa here, a paramecium that only likes to feed at the bottom of the beaker, and again, left to its own, it reaches its carrying capacity. We have a fourth species here that only likes to feed on the surface of the beaker. So fourth species, specialist, also reaches its carrying capacity when it lives alone. Put these two together, they're not in direct competition. 
One likes to feed at the surface, the other feeds on the bottom. They both reach their respective carrying capacities, and these two species can coexist because they have sufficiently divergent feeding strategies. Now, if we look at these processes through a much longer time scale, we expect an evolutionary outcome that involves the divergence in the physical or behavioral characteristics of the two overlapping species. And this is called character displacement. Let's consider the case where there are two species competing for the same resource, and each species possesses a physical trait that's necessary in order to extract that resource. Further, let's view that trait as being a quantitative trait. So the distribution of trait size in the population will follow a bell-shaped curve. So here we have species one with its bell-shaped curve with the trait size that's necessary for getting its food. And it's going to be interacting with a second species also with their physical trait showing a bell-shaped curve. Now within these two populations, there are larger individuals in the smaller species that are going to commonly be in direct competition with the smaller members of the larger species. Now because of this extra competition, the larger individuals in the smaller species are going to be at a disadvantage. This means that the smaller individuals of the smaller species will have a great reproductive advantage, and so trait size is expected to shrink in the already smaller species to become even smaller. And the slightly larger species is now expected to become even larger because those larger individuals are having less competition from the other species. Now let's take this idea to our friends, the Darwin's finches. Remember we have all these different species. They live on the Galapagos archipelago and they exist in different combinations on different islands. So if we have speciation, we have two separate species that evolved because they occupied for a while separate islands, each living alone. If they come back into contact with each other after a long period of separation, now they're going to be in direct competition with each other. And we're going to use Geospitza affortis and Geospitza fuliginosa to illustrate this point. On Daphne Island, Fortis is the only Darwin's finch that lives there, so it doesn't come into contact with Fuliginosa. Fuliginosa is the only Geospitza species on Crossman Island. And we can see when they live on these separate islands, Fortis is a tiny bit larger on average than Fuliginosa. But what happened when they came into contact with each other on these islands of Abingdon, Blindo, James, and Jervis? Okay, now the two species are coexisting. And amazingly enough, we see character displacement. In competition now with Fuliginosa, Fortis has gotten bigger. So the bell-shaped curve has been shifted to the right compared to what it was like when Fortis was living alone. And Fuliginosa has gotten even smaller compared to what it was when they lived alone. So this is a classic case of character displacement. Now they're sufficiently different in each other. They're going to be eating different sized seeds, and they can coexist. So, competition makes coexistence very difficult, but species can evolve through character displacement so as to cope.